Hi everyone, this is Atuta Baba from Nightlight Astrology, and today I'm going to show you a couple of cool tricks from my horary practice. Um, there's always, I know, a number of people who are trying to learn astrology um, through books and through online channels like my own and others. And um, although I offer classes in horary and natal astrology, um, I always like to try to provide some demos for people who either don't have the time or can't afford maybe even the um, sliding scale. We offer a lot of tuition discounts, but I know that some people can't even afford those. So I try to create some content, um, you know, for everybody. So, and, you know, I know that even people in my classes watch these because it's always cool if you're practicing to, you know, pile a little more practice on your plate. It's, uh, it's good, builds, uh, builds your interpretive skills. So, okay. I am first going to show you a horary that I did for my own daughter. Uh, which was sort of surprising to me um, because the outcome was not exactly what I expected it to be. I actually got it wrong. And I'll explain to you, try to explain to you why. So for those of you who don't know, horary is a form of astrology that begins with a question. And it's an outcome-oriented question, typically a yes or a no type of question. Um, those seem to work the best. Um, for example, uh, will I get the job? Will she call me back? Um, you know, you know, is my boyfriend talking to someone else? Whatever the case might be, um, oftentimes there's if there's a yes or no outcome oriented question, horary works really well. Um, should I questions, advice oriented questions, timing questions, not as good. Usually you need a little bit more of a consultation for advice questions, advice oriented questions, or an electional astrologer to choose the date or time of something. Um, but when it comes to horary, we're casting a chart for the moment that the question is asked from the position of the diviner, the reader. Um, so this question I asked because I noticed that my daughter was, she had a temperature. And of course, that's pretty scary given everything that's going on in the world right now. So um, I asked the question, does my daughter, um, uh, is my daughter sick? And, um, you know, will it get worse or will it get better? If so. And so just to show you how this begins, um, I'm the person asking the question. I'm not really important to the question in this case. So I want to identify my signifiers. Fifth house ruler in this case uh, is Jupiter. Now, I'll pause and just mention this, that in horary, in the way that I teach and the way that I learned horary originally, I learned from people who were studying medieval astrologers. And by that time, quadrant based houses had become a lot more you know, kind of dominant in the practice. And so I use Reggio Montanus for um, horary questions. This horary question um, was, you know, cast in Reggio Montanus chart style. So if it's looking, if you're used to seeing me use whole sign houses, I use whole sign houses for Hellenistic natal work. And then I use Reggio Montanus houses for horary. Uh, something I speak more about in my classes, but uh, I do recommend learning in quadrant based uh, forms of house division for horary in particular. Um, and I think it's easier to start with natal astrology than starting with horary. Uh, I think horary becomes easier after you learn a bit of natal first, but they, then they really complement one another, by the way. Okay, so anyway, the fifth house ruler, house of children, is going to be Jupiter. You've got Sagittarius 18 on the cusp of the fifth house. So Jupiter becomes signifier of my daughter. Well, that's not good. She's sitting on the cusp of the sixth house, place of sickness and disease. And uh, she is retrograde. She's represented by a retrograde Jupiter that's in its fall. So that answers the question, as far as I'm concerned, as to whether or not she's sick. I know she's sick because she's got a temperature, but I'm wondering, like, is she sick or did you know? Sometimes, is you, anyone who knows who has kids, it's kind of like, all right, is this a real thing or is this gonna like turn into something or what's going on here? Mm -hmm. uh, kids can be like mood rings with their sicknesses sometimes, especially if you have your kids in preschool or you know school or school's like a petri dish anyway we didn't she was actually out of school she's out of school right now but um so yeah jupiter's badly debilitated on the cusp of the house of illness so that that pretty much answers that question that does not mean just because jupiter's in you know kind of really bad shape that she's in really bad shape i asked the sky the question is my daughter sick it's just giving me the thumbs up yeah she's sick then I asked the question, well, if she is sick, is it going to get better or worse? Now, um, one of the things that threw me off in this horary a little bit, which I think is, you know, probably worth mentioning, is that 
Um, you know, there's, um, uh, when you're a parent, it's really hard to be objective as an astrologer. So I almost never, at this point, I, I really try to steer clear of reading my own chart or my kids' charts for things that I really know that I'm not emotionally objective about. Or even sometimes I can, as long as I, I've sort of squared up and been like, I'm ready for the answer, you know? Anyway, um, so, you know, what I couldn't perceive in this chart, which really, what really did not make sense to me was that um, I couldn't, I really couldn't figure out how Jupiter looked like it was going to improve any. Uh, I just didn't see it. I was like, I'm not seeing Jupiter getting any better. If I plug in the outer planets, Jupiter's heading for a conjunction with Pluto. <laughs> that, you know, that could really scare me. Um, but one thing that can really help in a horror area if someone's sick, if, they're, if their signifier is really giving away, hey, yeah, this person's sick, any kind of upcoming aspect with a benefic could be positive. What I didn't see at first, and you guys have probably heard me talk about this before, is you know, an Antitia or a Contra Antitia can show up in a horary and sometimes deliver the news. Well, here's Venus, and um, Venus is moving into a Contra Antitia with Jupiter, which honestly is not like it. Uh, I totally would not have really seen this as the. Uh, I wouldn't have seen this necessarily as at least in the anxiety, so sort of the, the state of anxiety that I was in, I would not have seen this as a really strong significator of her getting well. But in fact, it was uh, she was sick for about three days total. Um, and she tested negative for COVID. And here we have um, Contra Antitia forming between Venus and Jupiter. So she, she's actually very imminently connecting with a benefic in any kind of aspect with a benefic when you're in a bad state um, can be a good thing. So um, this was one of those charts where I looked and I was like, oh my God, you know, and I thought that that, that conjunction with Pluto in particular was not necessarily a good thing because tend to amplify the theme of difficulty for Jupiter, not really make it better. But actually she was almost, you know, by two days it was pretty much gone and then three it was completely gone. So turned out to be nothing more than a pretty simple virus. And she tested negative. My other daughter tested negative for both flu and COVID. Nobody else got sick. So it was, uh, all things considered, it was pretty easy. Well, what's the most imminent thing happening in the chart? Jupiter, her, although ill, is immediately connecting with benefic Venus. So that's a simple story of, you know, missing something, something that you wouldn't necessarily pick in a horary because a contra antitia is maybe not the strongest aspect in the world. Contra antitia is often read as oppositions. So even like an opposing planet, like doesn't really seem to deliver the message so strongly, but it's the most imminent thing happening. It is the most direct thing happening to Jupiter is contact with the benefic. So the most immediate thing happening to my daughter was contact with Venus. So that ended up being the decisive um, point here. All right, so I'm going to show you another horary. Um, this horary is, um, let's see here. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. All right, let me pause it here. Okay, so this horary is, will I find a home in X? X is a particular location that this person was interested in moving. And their question was basically, you know, will I be able to find a home there? So the person shows up as Saturn and the moon, ruler of the ascendant. And then the moon is always given to the querent as a co-significator or as the significator of the flow of events. And in this case, the fourth house is going to be the home location that they are hoping for. That's Mars in, um, in Pisces. Now, they had been having some difficulties finding a place. Now, how can we see that? Well, we see that because the moon is just separating from an opposition with Mars. Uh, with poor reception as well, there's maybe some emotional conflictedness. Moon is in Libra, which is the detriment of Mars. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, 
what is about to happen? Uh, so there might be, in other words, this person, that the, the moon as an indicator sometimes also of how we're feeling about things, um, maybe has mixed feelings. Uh, Saturn in this chart, her primary significator, is in um, Aquarius and is in no great dignity of Mars, but is just about to retrograde into Capricorn world where it will exalt Mars. Meanwhile, the moon is in Mars's um, uh, detriment. So it seems like there's some mixed feelings about whether or not this place may be the best or whether or not um, it's the right move. As you can tell that as the astrologer, when you see someone is asking about moving such and such place and the receptions are all mixed up, it's like, hmm, uh, sometimes, and you know, if I had an hour with someone, we could maybe kind of pull that stuff out a little bit more. But when you're doing horror, it's pretty quick. You're just, you're looking for quick answers to questions. Um, uh, unless you're in, you know, like, unless you, someone is in a consultation setting, but usually horror is not like that. It's, it's going to be you know, just will I find a, a place here? Yes or no. And then maybe there's some additional information that comes in. Well, in this one, the additional information is actually huge. So what's about to happen to Mars? If you look closely, Mars is at 2958 Pisces. And Mars, that means Mars is just about to change signs and enter Aries. What does it do as soon as it enters Aries? Uh, it's going to be in a fire sign and it's going to be in its own rulership, really becomes quite strong. But then, what kind of reception does it have with Saturn? Well, once it enters Aries, it is then in the fall of Saturn. And Saturn will retrograde back after connecting with Mars into uh, Capricorn, where it will exalt Mars, right? That's, uh, and then the moon will still be in the detriment of Mars. That's a very particular picture. So yes, the, first of all, the answer is, you see the ruler of the fourth house of home and uh, property. This is the planet that represents the home that she's thinking about looking for in this other particular locate in this particular place. So yes, you find one, but what kind of marriage are we talking about here with this house or with this place? Well, not very great because the moon will con continue to feel not so great about Mars from the sign of Libra, whereas uh, Saturn will start to exalt Mars, which means like almost like worship Mars. And that kind of, that'll have to come down eventually, right? So exaltation can sometimes represent someone being sort of um, adoring something, but doing so to almost like, like when you, you're like in the infatuation stage of a relationship where just it's just like too much. So... Mars, in the meantime, in Aries, will be in the fall of Saturn. So this person will worship this place, but the place will deeply not like or let down the person. And they'll continue to feel mixed about it in the midst of also uh, sort of worshiping it. So yes, you will find a place, but the subtext is beware because, um, you know, this place may let you down. It may not be all that you hope it is. Um, and so in a case like this, you know, sometimes the oracle will tell you, yes, you can find a place, but really be careful of whether it's the right place or not. Um, and often enough, you know, people are on a, like a, a, a crash course with fate. So it's, it, what I think is really interesting about Horary is that in this case, Mars meeting Saturn with such poor reception and um, such lopsided uh, you know, feelings and, and likely outcome in relation to expectations. Um, you know, yes, there's an opportunity here, but it wouldn't necessarily be good. Now, people will always ask the question, does that mean this will happen or does that mean it could happen? I'm of the mind usually that if a person is asking, you know, will, will I find a place? And, um, you know, if, there's, if, they're, if they're not dead set on it, you know, that, yeah, that this could be some advice here. And I, why would you get advice? from the oracle why would the oracle seem to show you how things will go ahead of time if there weren't some way in which our guides or divinity or spirit was not trying to speak to us a little bit so i take the oracle as being capable of giving advice and our future as being somewhat open not entirely open some things are determined but i always treat every horary as though there you know if if there's some element of the horary that's giving advice that 
I, I will try to give that insight in a manner that um, appreciates someone's free will. It says, hey, look, there, maybe there's another option here or be careful or really think it through or whatever. Um, now, um, on the other hand, though, with this person's signifier about to be in the exaltation of Mars and an opportunity presenting itself, it's kind of like, I don't know, like, let's just imagine you're in high school and there's someone that you're just, you know, you think is the bee's knees, you know, and you're just totally infatuated. And then they, you know, it turns out that they wouldn't be, they'd be open to like going out on a date with you or something like that. Well, it's going to be hard for you to really look objectively at that situation. And if the horary astrologer said like, well, they may really let you down. It may not be that great. You'd be like, well, I, I just have a hard time believing that you know, because, because you're just worshiping them at the moment. So similarly, oftentimes I'll see a case like this where in this case, I'll be like, yeah, the opportunity is going to present itself. I'm not sure it's all that you hope that it will be. So be really careful. They'll do it anyway. And then I'll get the news some months down the line or even a year later, or sometimes even several years later being like, you were right. It really didn't turn out great. You know, I was completely sold on it at the time. Um, other times, a person will hear this and they'll go, that's just what I needed to hear. I, I've been feeling a little mixed about it, and so I'm not going to do it. So uh, that's such as horary. You know, that's, that's what horary is uh, um, doing, is, is giving us advice and also giving us, I mean, it gives us, the. in my mind, the thing I love about horary the most is that it's giving you this view of fate and karma, which is that, like, you know, there's a, there's parameters of our fate and karma. Some things are destined, and then there's like some negotiation room with other things. Um, that's the actual, probably the most objective understanding of what ancient astrologers thought about fate uh, overall. And you can see this. Um, there's a recent talk that was done by Dorian Greenbaum. If you ever want to read a really good book about fate in the ancient world, um, she wrote a book called um, The Daimon in Hellenistic Astrology. And she talks a lot about fate in that book. Uh, on fate by Cicero is something that she mentioned in a recent talk that she gave uh, about the relationship between ancient astrology and fate. And in that text, um, you have Cicero and talking in, in a very similar manner to Plato about fate, uh, which is that there are certain things that are allotted or apportioned to us, like karma, like there's outcomes that are inevitable. And then there is some negotiating space. And part of what opens up that negotiating space with fate is our ability to be in communion with the stars and to become more divine in, in our nature, to awaken our own divine nature, which gives us more insight and intelligence. We're able to see um, through the eyes of the heavens into our own lives. And um, our, our free will is enhanced by those kinds of practices. Uh, horary is the same thing. When you work with horary long enough, and I've, I mean, I've been doing it I'm very slow in building experience because it's more predictive. So I, I'm in, in natal work, it's a, it's a little bit broader and more general. Hore, it's very specific. And so I've taken my time in in developing my horary practice. But one thing that horary does, maybe more than any other form of astrology, is teach you about the intricacies of fate and choice and their relationship because they are fate is the result of previous choices some of which are absolutely unavoidable and some of which uh, can be rewritten through new choices. Um, this is something that's also very common in the Indian view as well. So anyway, uh, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, demonstration. I'm still at my mom's place in Michigan. I should be back next week. Uh, we'll be doing a new moon talk, uh, hopefully on Monday as well. So um, stay tuned and I hope you're having a good one. Take care, everyone. Bye.